everyone and welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for our live talk session on mental health first aid with music support. As you may or may not know, this week is Mental Health Awareness Week. So thank you for taking the time out of your very busy, busy schedules to come and learn more about how we can all support the people in our industry better. Uh, for those who haven't joined a live talks before, my name is Gabby. I'm the head of partnerships at Live, uh, which is the voice of the UK's live music and entertainment business, representing thousands of businesses, artists and backstage workers. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a white female with brown eyes, blonde hair, and I'm wearing a white shirt and cream jacket with gold framed glasses. Uh, our Live Talks program is a series of free online workshops and talks which focus on equality, uh, diversity, inclusion, sustainability, and well being. And they're aimed at making the UK live music industry a more inclusive and positive place to work. Before I hand over to today's wonderful hosts, I just need to go through a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, so please note, we are recording today's session to share online for those unable to join. Uh, if you would rather remain anonymous, please feel free to keep your camera turned off and change your Zoom name to anonymous. Please make sure your mic is muted throughout to avoid interference. If we have some time left at the end, we will open up the floor to questions, but please also feel free to put any questions you have in the Zoom chat and we'll do our best to answer them at the end. Uh, a, recording, a, recording, a, recording, a recording of today's session will be made available via the live website, which I'll link in the chat just in a second. And that's it from me. So thank you to Music Support and our wonderful panelists for coming to speak to us today. Over to you, Norman. Thanks, Gabby. Hi, folks. Um, my name is Norman Beecher. I am the Senior Learning and Development Specialist at Music Support, and um, my pronouns are he and him, and I am a Black male. I'm currently wearing a brown jumper, and I have black rims glasses on. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Music Support, we're a charity that provides um, help and support to anyone in the music industry or live, live events affected by mental health and or addictions. And some of our core services include a helpline, which we run from nine to five um, every day. And it's manned by peers with lived experience. And um, we also have training in mental health first aid and addiction and recovery. We also provide a safe space at, at festivals, which we call a safe ups, for people who might be um, just needing a place to, to chill or maybe perhaps struggling a little bit and just want a, a supporting ear. Um, I am so, so pleased to be here today. And it's so um, gratifying to see so many of you just taking the time out. Uh, I understand in excess of 150 have signed up or in excess of 100 anyway. And I can see we have at least 50 here. So um, yeah, brilliant. Really, really lovely um, that you've taken the time out to be with us here. Um, uh, it's Mental Health Awareness Week and it would be lovely actually if we focused on mental health on a regular basis, that we just sort of don't wait for a particular week to focus on it. But it's also equally lovely that we actually take time out and focus on this stuff. It's so, so important. Um, and today we're going to be talking about mental health first year. We're going to look at what it is. And in a few minutes, I'm going to introduce you to two of our lovely alumni who have completed our course. But before I do that, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about what mental health first aid is and why you might want to do it. And Lynn's just going to share. So um, the first thing I just want to say is, um, why do we do mental health first aid? So, you, you know, what's the purpose of it? Well, here's some stats for you to look at. Uh, and this is this, the source for this was from the uh, Business in the Community 2019 Mental Health Summary Report. And the findings were that 61% of UK employees have experienced mental health issues due to work or where their work was a, a, a factor. 33% of workforce have been formally diagnosed with a mental health condition 
at some point in their lifetime. Now that's quite a significant amount, I would think, uh, yeah? And yet, despite all of that, we discriminate against people with mental health. So what happens when people are struggling, they don't come forward and say, look, I'm struggling because of fear that they may be discriminated against, it's that they may be judged. We are oftentimes not well informed about mental health or mental ill health. And we, some, we do, do, don't know how to differentiate between someone who has poor mental health, which is quite common, or someone who might be having a mental, um, uh, be living with mental ill health. Um, we lack the insight to realize that we need help. Sometimes we're not really sure. You know, we might be feeling a bit um, off and not really know what's going on. And we also pro perhaps don't always know where we might go to get um, the support. Um, professional help is not always available. And so mental health first aid is really vital to helping to support someone while um, they're waiting for uh, professional help. And the final reason why we um, you know, do mental health first aid is that the majority of us don't know how to respond. And oftentimes we respond from a position of fear because we just don't know what to do and we panic. And, um, and so mental health first aid really gives you a, a really good grounding in terms of how you might support someone and respond to them. And so the aims of mental health first aid are these to preserve life where the person may be at risk of harm for themselves or others. And so similar to like physical first aid, it doesn't teach you to be a counselor or a therapist or anything like that. It provides you with the knowledge and skills you need to provide that sort of first level support, the high first level support, um, so that someone who might be at risk of harm to themselves might get the help they need. To provide help to prevent the mental health issue from becoming more serious. We know that early intervention is really crucial in terms of um, preventing poor mental health from becoming a mental illness. Uh, to provide the recovery of good, to promote the recovery of good mental health. To provide comfort to a person with a mental health issue. Oftentimes, just having a listening ear could be all the, the individual might need to raise awareness of mental health issues in the community. And so part of um, the aims is to get on board campaigns that support um, mm -hmm. mental health and um, also to reduce the stigma and discrimination. And finally, and just as important as all the other stuff we've talked about, one of the key things that we look at um, during the Mental Health First Aid course is how we take care of ourselves generally, and also how we take care of ourselves while we are busy supporting others. So how have we been involved? Let's take a look. So um, we have two in-house mental health first aid instructors. I'm licensed by the Mental Health First Aid England to deliver their products. And so is my colleague, Hannah Brindley. Um, so we have two in-house, uh, instructors. To date, we've trained more than 500 um, learners in the industry, which I think is just um, amazing. Our training takes place uh, um, via Zoom, which is online over um, a two-week period, but there's four sessions over a two-week period. Or if you, if you work in an organization where there are, you have a group of people, 10 or more, we can provide that um, on a face-to-face -face basis as well. And um, yeah, you just need to get in touch with us and we'll, we could get some dates organized for you. You can um, see some of the testimonials from the courses that we have delivered on our website and my colleague Lynn will um, put that in the chat for you. And you could also contact us at learning at musicsupport.org. We are also pleased to offer certain industry freelancers the opportunity to become mental health first aiders with music support. 
Um, all you need to do is meet certain criteria and you can um, find out more about that. Again, Lynn will put the link in the chat um, and the, where you can then um, sign up and if you meet the criteria, we'll be in touch with you and book you on a course. The free um, courses thanks to, have been made available thanks to um, our funding partners, Backup Tech, uh, Rudy Cookbook, and Stagehand. Um, yeah, so there you go. So that's basically what uh, Mental Health First Aid is about. And we're joined today by two of our alumni, Matt Bagshaw and Natalie Witz Hillshaw. And I'm going to ask you guys to just introduce yourselves, just let, let folks know who you are, what you do, and then we'll start a, a, a conversation about your engagement with mental health first aid. Natalie, I'll start with you. So hi, I'm Natalie witz -Kilshire. As Norman just said, I work for the Musicians' Union. I'm the live theatre and music writers official at the MU. Um, I'm a white female. I've got black curly hair and uh, wearing tortoise rimmed glasses as well my pronouns are she and her um so yeah I've worked at the MU for four years but previous to that I was a freelance trombone player and a ranger as well um so I come from all aspects of the music industry I've done quite a, been involved in quite a lot of it but I also have a very keen interest in mental health and well-being as well so that's part of my role here at the MU. Thank you Natalie and Matt? Yeah uh just quickly uh thanks Gabby, Norman and Lynn for inviting me today um, I'm Matt. I work for Festival Services. What we kind of specialise in is providing people to festivals, so obviously, you know, get people into the event safely and things like that. Um, I am a he, him, white male with a quite long brown hair. My friends were saying I'm wearing my favourite colour, which, which is beige, uh, and I seem to be the only one not wearing glasses today. Um, I come from a background of let's say quite a different, very background compared to a lot of the people I know within the industry. I kind of started in banking, moved into the estate agency world, and I've jumped over into kind of the events industry. Um, and I think that puts me in quite a good light to kind of see how the events industry kind of fares up in terms of mental health compared to all these other industries as well. Thank you, Matt. And so, folks, what we're going to do is um, we're going to have a conversation. So Nat, Matt and I will have a conversation about mental health first aid. And um, we're going to do that for... 40 minutes or so, and then we'll leave a little bit of time at the end for you guys to ask any questions. Gabby, will you can either type your questions in the chat or send, I think, Gabby, you'll accept messages as well. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then, yeah, and then we'll leave a little bit of time at the end. So um, Nat and Matt, thanks so much for, um, for joining us. And I, I guess the first question I want to ask is, uh, so people have all kinds of reasons why they attend the Mental Health First Aid course. Uh, why did you do it? And Matt, I'll start with you. Okay. Thanks, this, so. And I guess it's because you have yourself unmuted. So <laughs> yeah, uh, like, let's just go with that. That's fine. So um, go with that. yeah, for me, I mean, I kind of started working with festival services probably like in 2020 when it was in its different iteration, but that kind of gave me an introduction within the events industry to understand kind of the long hours that are attributed kind of you know the way that people work long hours often working seven days a week and things like that and it put me in kind of, kind of like a bit of a mindset of going well you know this is quite important within the industry to champion because if people it's like the, the whole airplane analogy isn't it if you're not if the plane has an emergency you put on your mask first and then obviously you put the mask on around others so it's important for me to understand how I could help others um and with you know I work with probably hundreds of thousands of people a year and um, it's really important for me to kind of know how I can help or point them in the right direction so that and also I just kind of think knowledge is power with this kind of thing as well mm. I, I like that that what you've just said there about knowledge being power and I, I also think knowledge um change through happen change happens through knowledge as well isn't it change happens through becoming more aware um of how you might, and in this case, of how you might support someone. Uh, brilliant, thank you. And Natalie, how about you? Why did you do it? So 
well, I, as I said, I've got a keen interest in mental health anyway. But at the at the um, at the MU, you know, we represent over thirty three thousand members um, and musicians here in the UK. And it's although the role for us is internal, as really on the first base of it is, is assisting colleagues. It's also obviously external as well. You know, we're, we're helping members on a daily basis. Um, we're helping colleagues on a daily basis. We're interacting with other stakeholders. We're interacting with with out, out people outside of the organisation, and you know, on a personal level as well. You know, our personal relationships in everyday life. Um, for me, I wanted to gain a kind of deeper understanding of, of mental health and to learn kind of effective com communications as well, and really to develop my active listening. I know active listening and empathy is something that's talked about a lot on the course. Um, and it's something that I just wanted to, to sort of continue to work on. I'd already actually done the training um, before. So when I first joined the MU, I did it, but not with music support. And doing it with music support has really, really changed the changed it all for me, really, because having that kind of industry perspective as well, it's been, it's been really incredibly helpful for me to be able to help people outside of the organisation as well. Um, so, yeah, and I just think for me, the role of a mental health first aider, it, it, you know, it really plays a crucial role within the industry, especially for advocating for better mental health resources as well. We talk about that a lot about that on the course and supporting people within their communities as well. Um, and I like the fact that it puts a lot of focus on amplifying voices of underrepresented communities and, you know, addressing systematic, uh, systematic um, issues and advocating for equitable mental health care as well. And I think that having an awareness of those things and being constantly aware of those, it really helps me help other people and also to help myself and to make sure I'm guiding myself and others in the best way I possibly can. Mm. Lovely. You've, you've just really sort of highlighted what the whole course is about, really. It's, 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 it is quite a broad range, isn't it, the stuff that we discussed. And one of the things that you, you highlighted there so well was about the listening and learning, really learning to listen. And we talk a lot about that because oftentimes we, we tend to listen with a response in mind, don't we? And, 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 and while we're doing that, we actually are not hearing what the individual is actually saying. And, and, and so that's one of the really, really key things that I think I often say to people, you know, if you, if you leave here with nothing else, just leave with the idea that actually listening is perhaps the most important thing you could do for someone um, who's living with a mental mm -hmm. ill health. Um, so thanks for highlighting that. Tell me something, what was your experience like on the course in general? You talked about the fact that you liked the fact it was, you know, you did it with a bunch of folk that were from the industry and so that it was it was focused on the industry a bit more. But generally, what was your, your experience like? And I'll ask both of you to um, just elaborate on that a little bit. For me, I think every time I've done the course, well, every time, both times I've done the course, um, <laughs> I really um, learned something about myself, which has then helps me then help other people or to listen. As you said, that kind of that listening aspect you know we are taking phone calls every day here at the MU you know multiple phone calls every day and it can be about anything you know I, I, our department department I work for covers live theatre and music writers I mean that's almost all of the members you know in the, of, the, of the union so we could be listening to to any issues within those um, sectors mm -hmm. and I think that the training for me is certainly the experience of it it really helps me then put into practice those listening skills and how I'm interacting and proving how I'm interacting with myself, my colleagues, my friends and my family as well. Mm. Um, and it's that, that because you do a lot of role play as well, which might um, make people's like, hair stand up. And go, oh, I don't want to do it. Actually, it's brilliant, though, because you really do need to practice the language and the, and the way in which you would respond to somebody coming to you with, you with a problem. Um, yeah. And just for me, it just it's part of our job is creating a safe space for members. Yeah. and for colleagues and I think that that the it, it you are you create a very safe space during the course as well and I think it's really helpful to kind of to show us what it is to create so, so how to feel safe within that environment doing that kind of role play is completely out of my comfort zone but you feel very safe doing it so I think anything that we can do to, to kind of pass that and pay that forward onto other people as well creating that safe space where they want to talk to us about anything you know um yeah so for me that was a real big experience that I've taken from that on the course really. Lovely, thank you. Uh, how about you, Matt? 
Yeah, I mean, I think if I'm being very honest, kind of when I I was asked to attend the course first time, I was kind of like, oh, you know, I've got experience kind of handling, I guess, people around me and their mental health and things like that. And I was like, well, you know, I've kind of got real life experience. What what tangibly is this going to bring to me? And then when I did the course, I was like amazed by it. It literally, my experience couldn't have been any better. Um, I love the fact that quite like you said, Nat, like it's such a safe space. Like, although you don't have to do this, you find people kind of opening up within that safe space and sharing experiences. And that kind of informs different conversations to kind of, I know you guys move into breakout rooms and things like that. And you use all these different examples and it just becomes a really kind of welcoming experience. And that's kind of something that anyone should take away from that experience and kind of what they're looking to aid people with is kind of amplifying that experience and giving them the same thing. Um, yourself Norman was amazing on the course with me as well and I just think I took a lot more away from it than I thought I could ever take away from it and also this book uh, <laughs> like is a world of knowledge I'm happy to drop a book in the conversation um it has an amazing kind of piece at the back of it as well with lots of different kind of areas to um so I guess kind of different different avenues you can go down for different points of help so I, I couldn't. I couldn't champion the course. Well, lovely, and and I just there's a couple of things I just want to pick up there. You know, um, so Natalie, you mentioned about the role plays and how the how important it is to sort of practice the, the conversations, um, and um, and I want to highlight that. And, and and Matt also talked about the fact that it's quite a safe space to do this, and I just really want to highlight the importance of people recognizing that um, in as much as there's role plays and there's quite a, the, the, the course itself is activity focused, isn't it? It's quite a lot of activities. Um, but I wanna highlight two things that it's really, really, really is a safe space. And secondly, one of the things that we absolutely um, emphasize throughout is that people are not forced to do anything that they they'll want to do. So if they want to opt out of an activity, it's absolutely fine. They don't have to do it. Um, so there's no have tos. Um, it's 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 a good thing for them to do to practice, but yeah, really important for people to know that. Did the course change your the way you approach um, mental health in any way? So prior to the course, did you sort sort of think about mental health in a certain way or mental ill health in a certain way? And then after the course, did, it, did your approach shift in any way? I mean, I think for me, I've got lived experience with mental health issues myself and families. So I, by absolutely no means was I an expert or knew everything about it. However, I'd had conversations, you know, it wasn't unusual for me to have conversations. I'd be able to describe how I feel, how, you know, listening to others. So I'd been in that kind of situation before. But I think for me with the course what I really dug into especially this time is what it means to be empathetic and to have an and to, to have empathy and to respond with that as well and I think that hey you know I'd watched the YouTube videos of what the difference between <laughs> sympathy and empathy was before the course I was like oh well, that's I understand what that means on a basic level I understand what that means however without actually doing it and practicing it and really digging into that you don't I think as people, we are quite sympathetic creatures by default. And I think turning on that kind of empathy and really understanding what it means and to implement it daily as well has been transformative for me because you there are a lot many times where I'm on the phone to somebody, whether it's work, whether it's personal, and I want to just my initial reaction is to be sympathetic. <laughs> and then to I have to I really have a real conscious um switch in my mind of going, nope, that's not what they need. You know, we're gonna we're, we're following that. So every day I'm I'm definitely um embracing the things that we've learned on the course and I think it's really increased my confidence as well it's also helped me create my boundaries I mean I've always had very strong boundaries because my own mental health um hurdles that I have to oh, you know <laughs> hop and jump and climb over sometimes on a daily basis and doing the job that I do is very very difficult I'm sure colleagues that are on here will agree you know we 
we get a lot of phone calls and they can be work related, they can be personal related, they can be, you know, there are a lot of different things. And I think that that has really increased the courses very much increased my confidence in dealing with that because you don't know what's coming. So you could just pick up the phone call and it could be something somebody's in real, you know, mental distress and they and they really need some help and they've turned to us. And it's a gift that they and a privilege that they feel they can turn to us. And so our response to give them that gift back is to respond in, in a, you know, a way that's going to help them. And I think that certainly valuing and kind of respecting the unique experiences and perspectives of our members, but also individuals that I'm, you know, that I've socialize with and surround myself with more backgrounds I think especially we talk I said I've talked about it before but from the underrepresented groups as well it's something that really we put at the you know you put on the course is the forefront of our minds because you don't know well, I think we call it the frame of reference I don't have my book with me because it's at work in my office but I'm at home but yeah, I think it's the frame of reference we talk about you know always making sure that we have no idea what's going on in somebody else's life absolutely no idea so um I think that for me definitely has kind of changed the way I approach interactions, I think, just generally. Yeah. Oh lovely. That that is so much. I mean that that's just that's just amazing to hear. How about you, Matt? Yeah, I think I kind of echo everything that Nat just said as well. But for me, I guess because it's kind of a few different things. So like me personally, it's removing that stigma. So kind of coming away from the course it's kind of being able to openly have those conversations and not shy away from them mm. I mean me I guess kind of looking after a team of kind of five to six people internally I'm always that one checking in every day at the start of the day during the day the end of the day it's just having that touch point and knowing when people are really busy just to go you're not getting out you know you're not too overwhelmed how is it I can help and just really just trying to say look it's okay to talk that's absolutely yeah. fine um, another thing as well that I echo from that is like the work-life balance like I'm a massive champion of that like I don't I don't think you should turn your work phone on when you finish your shift um, and I echo that to everyone and that just kind of aids your your own kind of I guess your mental health and things like that to not help you get overwhelmed or kind of I think um, burnout for example is massive in this industry isn't it a lot of people feel like they get burnt out after like a year of heavy work or a few years and people tend to say it just creeps up on you so it's kind of about um positive what's the word for like positive kind of steps all the time to kind of reduce that kind of happening um and then as well for me you know psychological safety is a really big thing like people often feel like they can't make a mistake and that they, they kind of it spirals out of control and people kind of think you know my work is kind of not helping this situation but putting that psychological safety into the workplace again it's absolutely fine to make mistakes to talk to people and things like that is kind of what I've taken away from the course and just gone straight back to the, the business and gone this is what we're doing all the time um I think we touched on it I think during our pre-call um last week or so like I've introduced this thing called the break room at work where we all work from home but I'm a man of an office I used to work in an office for NatWest for like five years a state agent world for a few years after that um basically just opening up a, a, a google meets that everyone jumps in occasionally and just goes are you free to talk do you want to get a coffee do you want to get a coffee around the water cooler or, you know join the break room have a conversation just to kind of have that interaction just to help people every day mm. how lovely is that and, I, and I, what i hear there matt just in summary of what everything you've just said is that what you've done is normalized mental health yeah we, we 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 all sort of um you know we we speak openly about our physical health don't we we you know we have no problem with saying you know gosh i'm, I'm just now feeling i'm having yeah. today i'm not feeling too well physically but we shy away from doing that when it comes to our mental health and what i'm hearing you say is that actually we've provided a space where it's okay for people to say mm. I'm not okay and I'm not perfect and I got some things wrong and it's okay and yeah. that is that that's that's really amazing and that's where we want to move towards isn't it you wanted to say something else yeah I was going to say just off the back of that it's reminded me of something I attended kind of a conference this week and I was lucky enough to bump into one of my friends who's from like the marketing world and we attended a group together it kind of was about psychological safety which you know kind of goes hand in hand with mental health and he used the analogy of, you know, if, if you're a 35 year old guy or a girl that wants to just all of a sudden start mountain biking, skateboarding, things like that, what you do is you go through the safety procurement for that. So you're going to wear a helmet, 
you're going to wear your arm pads, your knee pads, things like that. But you should do the same when you're assessing kind of your role and what you need mentally, you know, mm. in those kind of that health and safety kind of element to your mental health as well as your physical health. And there's not enough of that. And this course kind of champions that as well. Oh, lovely. Absolutely brilliant. And something you mentioned, uh, Natalie, about um, our frame of reference and how we respond to people from our frame of reference. And our frame of reference, for those of you who don't know, just very briefly, it's 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 around sort of our attitudes and our belief, our beliefs, and, and it's formed by just about every single interaction we've had in our lives. So, you know, how we view mental ill health, it's formed by those interactions, how we view the beliefs we have, the values we have, they're all shaped by our frame of reference. And 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 that's what you were talking about, I think, Natalie, when you said about learning the difference between empathy and sympathy and empathy. Because oftentimes if we respond with sympathy and that's perhaps based on our frame of reference. And it's sometimes that's not the most effective way to respond. Because when we do that, we often respond from a position of wanting to fix. <laughs> and I'm a fixer myself. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a real fixer. I, I, I want to get in there and make it. And especially in the industry where, you know, the show has to go on. Regardless of what happens, the show must go on. So we are programmed to fix, aren't we? And so oftentimes when we, we, we are supporting someone with a mental health problem, we want to sort of jump in and fix it. And that's not always the most effective is what I'm hearing you saying that. And that actually the course taught you to maybe just take a step back and just be there with the individual because that's probably all they need, just someone to be there. Thank you. Um, so so this, this year's Mental Health First Aid, sorry, Mental Health Awareness Week, the, 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 the focus is on, on anxiety. And, and I just wanted to ask, does any one of you, do any do, do either of you have, have um, any thoughts on that at all? You know, that specifically on anxiety. I mean, from our members' perspective, you, life has got, you know, everybody's lives have got immeasurably more difficult haven't they over the last few mm. years and you know especially during the pandemic it was horrendous for our members there was lack of work if there was work at all you know not being in person is a very isolating experience for musicians a lot of the time especially if you're a composer a writer an arranger you're doing a lot of stuff on your own mm. um and I think you know we would we've talked as well Norman having me about touring musicians as well that is more stressful the most you know it's than ever it's been I mean like you know we've got Brexit we've got cost of living crisis we've got venues closing down we've got just general financial financial hardship amongst you know lots of um, stakeholders that would be involved in a tour and I think that and certainly for our, our members it is as much advice as we can provide about anxiety and as many with organizations that we can work with as well it would it's it, to prevent that as, as Matt was kind of talking about earlier is that burnout as well you yeah. know we see that going hand in hand that the, the burnout from the just the constant pressures of being a musician you know I was a musician for 15 years it's not all obviously it's a lovely um career and it's brilliant and it's creative and it's you know sociable but when any of those things are kind of removed that's an incredibly that's yeah it's it's it makes you very kind of unbalanced doesn't it and you're not you're not quite sure where you are and I think that to, yeah to have that focus this week is, is brilliant I think it will really resonate with a lot of our members mm. um and it resonates with me <laughs> you know I experienced anxiety um you know it's 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 nice to actually have that kind of talked about put in the forefront acknowledged so you're mm. not feeling alone I think that's the main thing isn't it that you're not the only one <laughs> you know there's lots of people out there and there's many kind of things that we can do to bring people together to, you know, to kind of mentor peer to peer that any of that, you know, those kinds of things. I think it's just so helpful for, for our industry. Yeah. I, I really liked what you just you said there about we're not alone. Oftentimes people living with um, a mental health condition often feel um, as if it's just them. 
And it's it's in normalizing it that we're going to get to the place where people are actually saying, actually, no, it's not just me. There are others just like me. And the more we talk about that, um, the better it's going to be. Thank you. How about you, Matt? Did you have anything to add there? Yeah, I, th I think something that's just resonated with me, though, that Nat just said. So Nat, you obviously were talking about, like, there's, there's all kind of these, I guess, like these anxieties, these worries in today's modern age. I mean, all of us here have sat through probably like four or five once in a lifetimes. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And to say that people, you know, aren't going to be affected by that would be really kind of not, not right. So I do really think this is an extremely um, important kind of qualification to gain. Um, and it is, like you said now, about not being alone, because I think everyone is, everyone's in the same boat. Everyone's going to react differently and feel differently to how things are going on. But it's just about providing that support and yeah, just being there to, to make sure you're having those healthy conversations. Mm. Lovely. And, and I suppose it's also worth noting, isn't it, that, that anxiety and stress are actually normal reactions to feeling threatened. I, I think it's really worth noting that, that actually there's nothing wrong with anxiety as such, nothing wrong with stress as such. In actual fact, it can actually motivate us you may, you may have heard people say, you know, I work better under pressure. You know, there is some truth to that statement, you know, because when we're under that little bit of pressure, um, there's a quote, and, and I'm going to try to remember, it, it, someone once said, um, all I need to succeed is a plan and just not enough time. Just a little bit, not enough time, and 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 there's there's some truth to that because what that does is it makes you it makes you it gives you that added sort of thing you need to propel you forward, but oftentimes a lot of people um, may have the anxiety when there's no threat around, or the anxiety might be out of proportion to the actual threat, and that's when the disorder actually happens. Just really want to highlight that because. Sometimes we, you know, when we think anxiety, we automatically think ill health, mm. not necessarily the case. Yeah, I think that was, you know, certainly on a tour that what would be, you know, when you're when you're traveling, and I don't mean necessarily, you know, I used to work in theatre, so going on a theatre tour, you're going, you're in places for a, a, a sort of generally a lengthy kind of period of time. And I think that, as you said, there is a difference between general, you know, anxiety that people have. That's yeah, yeah not normal because that isn't a word to be using in the same sentence but something that they can manage it's not going to massively yeah. affect their life it's it's part of their life that it's it's something they can handle and the, and it but there is a tipping point and I think that having as many people as we can that are trained to sort of see the difference between oh well that's you know that's something that they, they're, they're dealing with it it's there's something that they're they're living with and happily living with yeah. sometimes because you said I mean I never resonated to anything so hard in my life when you just said about the plan and with just let me not quite enough time to do it because that is me down to a T and I think that there is having as many people as we can to be aware that there is a tipping point and what happens yeah. when that point tips and what happens you know how to help that person how to connect how to make sure that you're giving them the support that they need I think is that is invaluable I mean yeah. I, could, I would have loved to have had something like that, especially in theatre tours where you're in quite an intense environment, only for, maybe only for three hours at a time, but it's incredibly intense three hours. And to have lots of people around that would, you know, to open up that conversation, as Matt was saying, I think this, yeah, would be incredibly helpful. Yeah, just having someone who's, who could actually normalise it for you. Yeah. You know, you're feeling anxious, that's okay. You have every right to be... And and also, if it becomes out of proportion, then guide you towards the help you need. Yeah. Um, brilliant. And speaking about guiding you towards the help you need, um, how about signposting? That one of the things we talk about a lot on the course is signposting. And um, I'm just wondering, have you had any opportunities to sort of use the skills that you learned on the course since doing the course? Um, and again, I'll start with Matt this time. Natalie, I've been starting with you you quite a bit. How about you, Matt? And then I'll jump back to you, Natalie. Yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely say I've had moments where the learning has has kicked in as such, almost on autopilot, which is good because it's ingrained. Mm. Uh, because I, I nearly used the wrong terminology. I, I have kind of a few 
close friends that do kind of suffer from from anxiety and kind of more further down the line symptoms as well and it's just knowing when to I think like you said that as well like just sit back and listen and just know that they're they're not doing these things because they they, they mean to they're, they're crying out for support and sometimes it really just needs that kind of sit down a conversation to be had and just signposting what's there and available for them moving forward and doing it in a what was the terminology from the, from the course is it non-judgmental way um doing that in a, a caring and, and you know empathetic way and just going the signpost and this is what's available and not pushing too hard that has definitely come in um and obviously will be an asset for me moving into I guess what is going to be a very busy festival season um as, as we know going to any kind of festival or any kind of show there's a plethora of different types of persons within that show um and obviously something like that can happen at any point so it's it's really yeah, held true lovely and you now I mean, the next day after we completed the course, I had um, to, I had to use it. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I mean, and I'm, you know, I think one of the things to note is, as Matt said, you use it on an everyday basis, whether you know it or not. After a while, it does become ingrained, and that doesn't mean you going, oh, you're feeling stressed. Hit the list of organisations. You know, yeah. that's what it means. It it means kind of it sometimes means that and in certainly in the way what happened with the day after that's what it meant it meant in a kind of systematic way we took we went through some steps with that person and and also we said we've got a support network of uh, mental health first aiders at the MU we have our own groups all anonymized you know if we need any kind of assistance on what next steps so we all kind of few of us had a discussion together about the best thing to to do um as I said completely anonymous they didn't know who I was talking about, whether it was a member, whether it was a colleague, whether it was a, somebody in my, you know, they don't, we don't share details like that. But so, I, yeah, the next day I was, I was doing it um, because that's the, that's kind of what our life is a little bit like at the MU. You know, we've, as I said, we members call us up, which is great. And we offer that safe space for them. So yeah, we're using it the next day. I mean, and that was a quite a serious case. I'm not going to go into any more details because yeah. I'm not going to trigger anybody or I don't want to upset anybody. But yeah, so that that was quite um, a high intensity. I mean, I don't, goodness knows what, I don't know what I would have done um, previous to the course. I mean, you know, not, I'm, I'm not, a, I would have understood, but I definitely wouldn't have had the resources. And I literally having an app to go, okay, well, where do you live? Here's a, here's a few organisations that might be able to help you, you know, that kind of thing. And but that's a, an extreme. And the other, on the other side, the general day to day, as Matt said, is just having that kind of knowledge of, OK, there are steps we can take with, the, with that. With, if somebody's kind of exhibiting behaviours that you don't feel are safe for them. Um, mm. Certainly on a personal basis, I had that with a friend that came to me and, there were, you know, we have questions that we ask people when, as I said, I'm not going to go into it because I don't want to trigger anybody. But it, I asked, I got I had to ask those questions, you know. And it was really, and that person is now actually is getting help with organisations that we're affiliated with. So I think that that's down to the training because I would never have had the guts to ask it because I just would have been too scared to ask it. And I think actually putting it into words really helped that person. That's certainly not giving me any kudos. It's absolutely all on <laughs> and that's really first aid, aid, aid training because I was would have never have asked those questions. I would have been sympathetic probably I would have been even a little bit you know tried to really yeah, be yeah. empathetic as well but I definitely wouldn't have approached it head-on in a calm but also supportive way and I think that's one of the things that you learn on the course is is to approach things you know effectively but but in a in a nice manner as well like so you're not yeah. overwhelming person yeah. and it's a friendly you know they feel they can come back and yeah Totally. And, and you know, it's, I started at the beginning by talking about the fact that we sometimes respond from a position of fear. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hearing you say is actually, I was able to respond with that, even though I was a bit anxious about it, I was able to respond because I had a systematic way to, to deal with it. And that is, in fact, what the course is about. Lovely to hear. And thank you. So one final question before we start to take, we, we've got some questions coming in. So I'm going to ask you both just one final question before we take some questions from the from the audience. Um, what are your aspirations in terms of mental health first aid going forward? How would you like to see this, this area expanded going forward? In the industry, I guess. Go on, Matt. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go. I'll go first. I mean, 
I know I know you've got obviously your ambitions as a, as um an organization um to obviously to ensure a certain amount of people out of out out of 20 one in 20 people in mental health first aid trained we'll something like foot that. With some of our partners yeah to do yeah and for, for me I just I would like to see you know the awareness of the course be heightened a bit more um and hopefully kind of get more people kind of within the events industry and any industry as a whole to be honest anywhere where there's kind of any sort of stress um kind of aiming to get kind of their staff or kind of one person per office or one person per aspect of an event kind of equipped to handle what can happen on site and the knowledge of this course um for me personally i as well like i think anyone that does it it really will inform them to go back to where they work or what they do personally to maybe make changes as well so for me what i would like to see aspirationally coming out of the course is just people learning about the course a bit more about themselves and going back and making tangible change to kind of go this is okay um similar to us like um we've made a few changes such as you know just trying to uh just bring it to the forefront of people's minds that you know i guess like being active um really is a positive attitude towards mental health so we're potentially paying for the gym membership of our team and things like that so just small quality of change like that is what i really want to see everyone take brilliant lovely and doing that i think you know we talked about this on our pre-chat but it needs to be as common as physical first aid i think isn't it one in four people in the uk experience mental health problems i think each year and we, you know, we did a lot of obviously a lot of work during the pandemic on our health and well-being of our members. And we know that between like sort of 2019, 20, just over a year, that more and more uh, obviously there are a lot more issues being being divulged, but then the unfortunately the quality of the care was suffering because of the amount of people on the waiting list and the and the, and the environments. And we know that when communities have safe and green environments, for example, good quality and accessible uh, public services and well-developed um, sort of social networks, they're better able to cope with adversity. And I think that that is part of the MHFA is part of, so the Mental Health First Aider, love an acronym, sorry. It, it's absolutely part of that and creating that better social network so that our fellow peers, our colleagues, our family, our friends, our loved ones can, can better cope with that with with that and have a bit have resilience and I think that also we you know if we want to make sure that we're focusing on inclusion as well and creating those kind of equitable and I guess thriving you know communities as well and part of that is having people that are on hand to listen and to to, to help and to assist and we know that musicians are becoming much more aware of self uh, practicing self-care and we do a lot of work on that as well at the MU you know and, and helping members recognizing that but we know there's a lot of there's a long way to go to ensure that everybody is supported mm. um so as many people that can train up the better as far as i'm concerned because i know that even in just an group that we have at the mu it's a lovely group it's a really warm inviting group and that it does emulate a, it, you know it has ripple effects throughout an organization even if one person is trained um mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't, I'd, I go on and on. I can't <laughs> recommend it highly enough. But I didn't hope my hope and aspiration is that everybody is trained in the whole of the UK and it's it's part because we all recognise it's part of a, a problem here in the, you know, in our country, but across the world. And it's something that we all need to actually face head on rather than just, you know, it's taking active steps, isn't it? Yeah. And my aspiration would be to see mental health first aid become mandatory. Mm. That's it, really. It should <laughs> be part of health that, and safety, you know. Yeah, oh. it should be. Yeah, very much like physical first aid is mandatory in an organization that has so many employees. I would like to see it become mandatory. That is my <laughs> my little bit for today. Listen, thank you both so much for sharing your experience on the course. And I hope, I am sure absolutely you've inspired others uh, to take the course as well. We're going to take some questions from the audience now, yeah? And um so Lynn has just uh, forwarded me a few questions. I'm going to try to get through as many of them as I can. Um, so the first one is, in what part of the industry do you feel is affected the most with challenge and mental health issues or scenarios? And what tips do you pass on to your artist colleagues to help in those moments? Um, over to either of you. Uh, and and I guess I'm 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 reading this question. I'm thinking, okay, so 
yeah <laughs> what part of the industry do you feel is mo yeah. most challenging in terms of mental health issues i mean from my perspective having worked in a lot of the industry in all aspects of it i don't think any one is more challenged than the other yeah. i think every single aspect of it has got its own challenges and has it's has it's got you know it, because they're, they're all so different but some of the but all, are they all the same at the same time it's I really don't think there is an answer to that. I don't think we can say. I think we there are there are different challenges for different sectors, and um, it's our job personally, and, and obviously music support and other organisations out there that are there to to help with those nuances. I can see somebody's put music education. I mean, yeah, I mean music education, composers, music writers, theatre, touring musicians, session musicians. You know, going on and on and on. Yeah, all yeah. People are involved in music. They all have different issues. What, you know, like like in life, we go. If only I had a bit more money. I look. If only I was like Joe, I would have. I, there's no Joe here. I just made that up, obviously. Uh, you know, <laughs> Joe blogs is what I meant. You know, I, if only I had that, I would be happy. If, if yeah. you're working as a teacher, if only I was doing more sessions, I'd be happy. We all know that that actually is not true. That yeah. it, just because certain aspirations are, are, are met, it doesn't necessarily mean you're <laughs> suddenly all your problems are cured and you're going to have a lovely life and skipping down the road. We know that's not true. And although I still firmly try and tell myself that it's true, if I just do that, then, you know, if I just get that email out of my email, I've got my inbox and my life will transform. It's not going to. Um, but I still go and believe that. But I think that that is the one thing to remember, even if you're in one part of the industry and you kind of do that, the grass isn't necessarily greener because it's a different um part of it however what i also want to also say is that it's a, a fantastic industry so don't that it wasn't supposed to be a negative spin on the music industry i loved it i did i i loved it it's a fantastic industry to be in it's brilliant and it's and it has so many incredible opportunities for musicians as well um mm. But with with chat, you know, there are always challenges with those things as well. So, um, yeah, from, I, I'm sorry, that's a really terrible answer because the answer is everything. No, I think I think you actually <laughs> hit it on the head. I, you know, what what's challenging for one person might not be necessarily challenging for another. So it doesn't necessarily mean that one particular part of the industry is any more challenging. It's it's about the individual, isn't it? Really, mm -hmm. and I, I think that you really it, it's that your your sentiment as well, Matt. Yeah, I, I pretty much was going to echo a similar thing. I mean, everyone is completely different. You could be in the most high octane, high stress situation and be totally fine. Whereas one person could be could obviously just not handle that in a similar way. Obviously, yeah. everyone's got their own signs and their own signposts when things are going to happen. Obviously, if you get go from being this busy to this busy overnight, yeah. obviously you're going to go, OK, well, that's a bit much. Some people might not. Some people, some people may. So it is all literally about the person understanding who they are and how they work, um, how you can help kind of kind of negate those risks, I suppose, just to, you know, try and manage, manage how they're feeling and things like that. Um, there's no one size fits all, but yeah. this is, I guess, just a framework to try and understand the person in front of you. Um, and that's, I, th I think, is probably the most integral thing that you can take away from it. Lovely. Thank you. Um, the second question, how do you approach a situation where someone isn't ready to get help? I guess I could um, address that one. Um, so it's a really good question, actually, and one that I just I just want to highlight one of the things that we focus on so much on the course and why we do. The listening, we talked about a lot, and empathy. One of the reasons why we focus on that so much is exactly that. Sometimes people are not ready for help. They're not in a place yet where they can say, yes, I, 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 I'll submit to the help or whatever it is. For whatever reasons, they, there's a number of reasons why someone might not be ready for help. However, if they feel listened to and they feel heard, and the, um, guess what? When they're ready, they will come back to you. You will be the person they'll come back to when they're ready. You can't force someone to get help if they don't want to. But if you approach it from a standpoint of really wanting to understand what the individual is going through, they will feel supported, they will feel heard. And with that, they will, when they're ready, they'll come back to you. I think that's the best I could do in terms of responding to that particular question. Um, uh, question three, when talking to someone who has 
or suffers from anxiety, do you play devil's advocate or is that considered counterproductive? Um, I'm guessing, hmm, I'm not really sure what this person is asking. Do you play devil's advocate or is that co considered counterproductive? I'm not really sure. The way I interpreted that when I read it was, is it a kind of situation where you say, I don't know, let's go Joe Bloggs, said, was really, didn't speak to me today, I don't know, was really quiet, didn't, I think there's something wrong. And if somebody's playing devil's advocate, then they might say, well, you know, it might not be you, it might be, you know, they might miss the bus or they might, you know, kind mm -hmm. of trying to see the other side of it. I think we talk about that, don't we, in the training about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, that, I mean, I'm just, that's my interpretation of the question so it could be incredibly uh, <laughs> I, think, I think that kind of interpretation as well opens up the question doesn't it of going well if you're talking about are you okay too much that person is like going to have a negative effect as well but I think there's no harm in just opening up that door and having that conversation irrespective of whether or not it's there's somebody playing devil's advocate or not I think uh, it's the yeah. safest thing to do yeah yeah, I suppose, uh, yeah, the, the way I read this question was more like, was kind of exactly that. So do you believe the individual or do you yeah. sort of, um, yeah. Or, yeah, I don't think people ever really make up the fact that they're struggling with mental health condition. Mm -hmm. You know, with, with all the stigma around it, I don't think anybody's going to uh, pretend that they have a mental health condition. And I, I think if someone approaches you um with anxiety in this case with anxiety i think you need to take it seriously mm -hmm. if, um someone approaches you and says they're afraid of something um re remember that it's this individual's fear it may not um what well, something that might seem totally innocuous to you might be massive for someone else and so again it's why we need to think about responding with empathy so put yourself in that person's place and think well if I was afraid of that would I be anxious <laughs> yeah if I was afraid of that spider in the corner of that room would I be anxious and mm -hmm. if the answer is yes then you could see why the individual is, is uh, wearing you know, another person's hat isn't it yeah it is it's yeah um but yeah I don't think anybody ever sort of pretends they have a mental health condition when they don't and that in itself, if they do, then there is a problem there as well. So regardless of which way you look at it, there is a problem that, that yeah. needs to be sorted. I think One it goes final... back to that. Oh, sorry. I was just no, going to go say, ahead. it goes back to that empathy, doesn't it? Of, of having an empathetic, you know, yeah. having empathy rather than sympathy. And I think that you may sort of go to a sympathy response might be something kind of like a devil's advocate. Well, you know, maybe they, it doesn't sound that bad or I'm not saying yeah. I'm, I'm going to an extreme, extreme here. Obviously that's, I'm sure that's not what you mean, but, um, but I think with the, when you're having it, when you're having empathy with somebody else or when you're exhibiting empathy, you're not, you're not, you're just sitting with them with that feeling. You're not trying to analyze it. You're not trying to um, change it. You're not trying to make them feel any better necessarily in that moment by, you know, trying to, offset it with another reason why that interaction may have happened I think it's about sitting with it but obviously I'm not an expert but that's yeah. I remember we talked about that quite a lot didn't we in our sessions yeah lovely hey listen thank you uh, look uh, we've <laughs> we had a few more questions um we've not going to have enough time to respond to them all um so Lynn's going to put in the chat um, or email address and if you want to want us to follow up with any of your questions please 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 reach out and we will absolutely respond um, as soon as time allows listen I really want to thank both of you for taking your time out today to be with us and for you know engaging in this lovely conversation and to you Gabby thank you so much for inviting us to do this it's been brilliant and thank you, folks, for all of you, all 49 of you <laughs> who, are, who are on the call today. Thanks again. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, we'll, we'll share a link for the video for this session on our website. Uh, 
probably this afternoon. So keep an eye out and sh please share with your colleagues and friends to help us reach as many people as possible. Um, thank you, Norman and Lynn. And thanks, Matt and Natalie, for all your time and efforts for putting to get, uh, today's amazing session together. And I hope to see you all at one of our future live talk events. Thanks, everyone. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, guys. Bye, thanks. folks.